Dr. Sims, thank you for joining us today to share your perspective on COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Shireen Malik of Zali, the Health Equity Officer for San Mateo County. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career? Yes, I can. So I am a practicing emergency medicine physician and sports medicine physician. Um, I currently work at Mills Peninsula Hospital in Burlingame um, in the emergency department with Mills Peninsula Emergency Medical Associates. Um, in my sports medicine realm, I work as the senior vice president and head of medical affairs for the National Basketball Association. Um, my career has taken me um, up and down California. So I spent 10 years at Stanford getting my undergrad master's in medical degrees. I went to Los Angeles to do my residency in emergency medicine at Harbor UCLA, um, one of the county uh, trauma centers, and then returned to Stanford in 2010 to do a sports medicine fellowship and have been in the Bay Area um, since then, in San Mateo, in fact. So um, for the past decade, I've been a San Mateo resident and I started at Mills Peninsula in 2013. So been in the community quite a while practicing medicine. We couldn't have picked a better person to interview for this with your long history, your credentials, and also you being local and knowing the community really well. I myself have a master's in public health, no medical degrees, and have dedicated really my almost 20 years um, in this work to advancing health equity by addressing racial and social inequities. And we know health doesn't happen in a doctor's office. It happens where you live, where you work, where you play and go to school. But this is the first time in my career where I've seen the scale of a pandemic ravage through our communities and particularly our communities of color. I'm really excited that the vaccine is available. And I'm curious about what your thoughts are about the efficacy of the vaccine. What can you tell us about the safety of the vaccines? So there are a few things that are very much worthwhile clearing up. Um, the fact that the technology behind the mRNA vaccine, which are the vaccines that Pfizer and Moderna are um, using and have studied, those vaccines, the mRNA technology has been out for a decade. So some people think that this was rushed um, and Operation Warp Speed didn't necessarily help um, with that perception, but this isn't something that, that scientists pulled out of thin air. This is a technology that they had been working on and refining for a very long time. Um, I have looked at the results of the clinical trials, um, the diversity of the populations that they've included in those trials, the safety, the efficacy, the side effect profiles, and in consultation with infectious disease experts, epidemiologists, um, and listening to our, our governmental leaders, I came to the conclusion myself personally that this was safe and it was effective. And to that end, on December 18th, I got my first shot. And tomorrow, I get my second dose um, of the Pfizer vaccine. So personally, I, I trust this vaccine. But also from a scientific and medical point of view, I do see that this vaccine is effective, that it is safe. And it is something that people should strongly consider um, once they have the information to make an informed decision. Oh, that's really wonderful. Thanks for laying that out for us. And I'm glad you've been deep into the science of this because it is a bit over my head. But I will tell you, I'm not on the front lines, um, so I haven't received the vaccine, but I am absolutely looking forward to getting it. But it helps to have your reassurance. Locally, many of our leaders of color um, focus on the well beings of our Black, Indigenous communities of color in San Mateo County, have shared how skeptical our communities are of the vaccine. Many have reservations because of the, rightfully so, because of the painful history of health research and experimentation of people of color throughout the history in the United States, and other concerns, like you mentioned, about how quickly it was developed. What would you say to people who share this kind of skepticism? So the first thing I would say, it's sort of a rhetorical question back to you or to someone who's asking the question is why are people skeptical? Why are they hesitant? And that bears addressing. And one of the reasons, as you mentioned, is the history, but another reason is the present. So mm -hmm. I think it's worthwhile to address institutional untrustworthiness and our discussion for why people may be feeling a certain way about the vaccine or access to medical care. So that is, that's first and foremost. I do think that 
from the medical and healthcare point of view, there needs to be an acknowledgement of those past wrongdoings. There needs to be an acknowledgement that there are inequities that currently exist. And I can just delineate a few of them. If you take, for instance, Dr. J. Marion Sims, a gynecologist who did experimentation on enslaved black women without anesthesia to develop gynecological tools and procedures, perfected them and then took them over to Europe where he would sedate patients to do those procedures or use those tools. Or Henrietta Lacks and using her cells for the development of cancer technologies without any accreditation to her or compensation to her family after she had passed away. Of course, one famous one known as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And I, I can go on and on, but th there are specific instances where people go, well, I have a reason. But if you bring it current, if you bring it current, and this is really painful, Dr. Susan Moore, who was a black physician in the hospital with COVID and was pleading to get treatment that she knew would help her in terms of how she was feeling, but also treatment in terms of helping her with COVID. That's a very current situation. So I think those are instances that we have to just acknowledge. Like there are things that are there that cause people to say, I just don't know. This pandemic is revealing health and racial inequities that have always been there. And so I say to those people who are suspicious, be patient with us. I think this is an opportunity for medicine to get it right. This is an opportunity for the healthcare system to extend the hand of partnership, to bring the community in closer, to say, we're going to give you better access. We're going to be more attentive. We're going to answer your questions. We're going to share the data. And that is what can be done to build that trust. To, to speak on this a little bit more, I think that the onus is on the healthcare system and the medical system to gain the trust of black, brown, indigenous communities. They have to be there, they have to do it. And once you start from a vantage of trust, then a lot of medical treatment and access issues start to rectify themselves. I say this all the time as a physician. If I prescribe to you a treatment and you don't take it, it's not gonna work. But we're partners here. I'm recommending this medication. I'm trusting that you're going to take it. You're trusting me that I'm giving you something that's going to be effective. And it's only gonna be as effective as our relationship is. So with my patients, it's a partnership. And there is mutual respect, there's trust, there is informed consent and decision-making. And so that is what we have to do with the community as it relates to COVID and in particular, this vaccine. I really appreciate you both um, bringing specific examples of that painful history, dark history, but also bringing it to the present, how we're still really need to do a lot more to address the inequities that are both in our medical system, but also in the social and economic factors that determine people's health outcomes, where our people of color continue to be uh, behind the eight ball. I think that we there is some real legitimate reasons why communities of color um, have a mistrust in given the history and the current situation. And we have a lot of work to do, a lot of hard work, not just for this vaccine, as you mentioned, or the pandemic as a whole, whole, but for everything that we do in the health system and as a government agency, period. Um, and I do hope that we're able to make some inroads given the timeline with the vaccine. Will you recommend the vaccine to your family and friends? I do recommend the vaccine for my family, for my friends, for my patients, and those in the community. But I do, again, think that it's, it's important that they have the right information. I don't, I don't recommend it as a blanket recommendation. What I do say is I recommend it for those who don't have contraindications to receiving it. And that's important that you have to have a conversation with your physician about your current health status, about medications that you may be taking that could preclude you from, from receiving the vaccine. So for those who are able to receive it and there are no significant risks, then absolutely, I do recommend that they get the vaccine. Dr. Sims, could you give us a definition of contraindication? Contraindica what was that word? <laughs> contraindication. So, so for example, 
people who have historically had challenges with vaccines, whether it's the flu vaccine or measles or boosters, there are some people whose bodies react to vaccines. Another thing that we've seen um, out of Europe is that some people have had um, allergic, significant allergic reactions or anaphylactic reactions to the vaccine. And so the recommendation is that if people have a history of anaphylaxis, that they may not be um, people who are recommended to get the vaccine. So those are some of the things um, to take into consideration, but it, it's all a risk benefit analysis. What are the risks of getting the vaccine? What are the benefits um, given your current um, medical and health situation? And what alternatives do you have? Um, recognizing that right now we do have this mRNA based vaccine, but in development are vaccines that use more of the traditional um, vaccine mechanism of either an attenuated virus, which is weakened or a killed virus and, and using that for antibody and immune development. Thank you. And anaphylaxis, it's my understanding too, that in a clinical setting where there is emergency response available, that they've been very successful at making sure that there are no long, long lasting issues with the patients. When I received my vaccine um, at Mills Peninsula Hospital, which is part of Sutter Health, they had a gurney that was present. They had sort of a rescue kit, which included epinephrine, if someone had an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, Benadryl, IVs, et cetera. And so, you know, we in the healthcare uh, profession, we're aware that allergic reactions can happen. After receiving the vaccine, there's a period of 15 to 20 minutes where you're asked to wait um, on site so that you can be observed for any, any type of uh, side effects or adverse reactions so that a medical intervention can take place. Great, thank you. I know for, for myself, I've been kind of all over my parents to make sure they have the information they need so that when it's they tr their turn, that um, they'll be first in line for it. Is there anything else, Dr. Sims, that you think is important for us to share with about the vaccine? As it relates to the vaccine, I think that we need to do a good job of publicizing it. And I think that it's both the message and the messengers. So as it relates to our community, we need to take advantage of community-based organizations who have the trust of the community to deliver the message. If we're talking to the black community, we need black physicians who are there. We, we can look at the National Medical Association, the National Urban League. They're highly involved. They're highly trusted. We should, we should take advantage of that. We, we know that community leaders, community organizers, ministers, that, that they have the eyes and ears of the community, and we should harness those relationships for the benefit of the community and for medicine. I think that is one key place that we, we could really make inroads. Other things that we can do, I think that we need to have legislation, and this is where government comes in, that really addresses the, the, the social determinants of health. And what are those? Jobs, housing, education. When we make an investment in the black, the brown, the indigenous communities, such that the access to jobs, housing, and education keep people at a high and competitive level, their health is better. Their access to food is better. Their decision-making is better. So there needs to be an investment and political investment behind that. We need to see information about this vaccine everywhere. I should be seeing it in pop-up ads on the internet, television commercials, billboards on the sides of buses, and we just have it. So wh why is it? We, why are we not touting this technology that we have developed, the safety of it, where to get it, how to access it, all of that information should be so readily available. And we need to, 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 to continually deliver that message. The vaccine is here, the vaccine is safe, the vaccine works. People who look like you recommend the vaccine, people who look like you have received the vaccine and they're doing well. And that's what's going to bring this pandemic to a close. But that is what we need to be doing. And finally, we need, we need funding for it, obviously. I think that's been one of the biggest challenges with the rollout is that people like yourselves, people who me, the doctors in the hospital turn to, the Department of Public Health, we turn to you for, what, for information about 
isolation and quarantining individuals who have COVID, people who are homeless who need housing for COVID, the information and work that you normally do. And then, hey, on top of that, we're also asking you to come up with a system to deliver these, these vaccines. The system is stressed. We need more bodies. We need more people. And the way you get that is through funding. So the money has to be there to match, whether it's advertisement or more individuals to help the Department of Public Health administer these vaccines. So much needs to be done, but that, and it can be done. But what we're doing right here today, this is a conversation. It needs to be a series of conversation. It can't just be a one and done. And I think that with those things, we will be successful. I really appreciate those. I mean, the points that you raised, Dr. Sims, are so important. One around making sure that we have trusted messengers in the community that are communities that particularly have mistrust are Black, Indigenous communities of color, that they are trusted messengers in those communities that are talking about this like yourself. We also do need more funding. Um, we do need support and resources for our community, um, our trusted messengers in our communities, our community-based organizations, all the staffing and supports that are needed to make sure that this is not just done, but that it's done right. And it's done right for those that are most impacted, not just by COVID, but by, but, but by all the social determinants of health that you just mentioned. And certainly preaching to the choir here around the need for us to be very focused on the structural uh, and institutional barriers that limit people of color and low-income people from reaching their full potential, because that is at the heart of why we're struggling here with COVID, with the inequities, because of the overcrowded housing, because of the high cost of housing, the, um, the fact that our incomes have not kept up with the housing costs and people are doubling and tripling up and our essential workers um, have limited opportunities for growth. So I do absolutely think that those three points are really important for us to take to heart. And I hope that we can, and we will be doing all the things that you mentioned to, as we strive to make sure everyone gets vaccinated in San Mateo County. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Sims. I know how busy you are both with treating patients, but also uh, in your community. So thanks for making the time to be with us. And I love the idea of a series of conversations. So you may have just um, got yourself in trouble with some more work here. <laughs> I, 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 am, I am available and I am ready to be a part of that process. Um, I do strongly believe that more people than we think will want the vaccine. They want the information. They just want to know that it's truly safe and that we're not feeding them some type of party line. And so what I'm here to say today to our community, to San Mateo County, that I believe in the science. I've read it. I trust the data. I really believe in our Department of Public Health and the work that they're doing. And I would not be out here advocating for something I did not believe in personally. I believe in this for myself. I believe in it for my wife, who is a physician. She's in line to get it. I believe it for my mom, my dad. I believe it for you. And so when it is your turn to get it, we will hopefully be able to answer your questions, to, to really assuage your fears and anxiety about it and get you the medical and immune boost that you need for us to stem the tide of this uh, pandemic and get us back to a position where we can start to gather together and do things that we've been so desperately missing. I so share your hope, Dr. Sims. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to talking with you again. My pleasure. You're welcome.